Good afternoon. It's good to see such a a good crowd for, for today's talk, so thank you all for coming. I'm Adam Scher, Vice President for Collections and Exhibitions, and I welcome you to your Virginia Museum of History and Culture. The VMHC acknowledges the Powhatan Confederacy and the Monacan Nation that inhabited the land where this museum now stands. We seek to honor that history and maintain thoughtful relationships with those indigenous people and all the tribes of Virginia. Their story is integral to Virginia's past, present, and future. We also would like to acknowledge the generosity of former trustee Ann Worrell, who endowed this lecture series in honor of our former president and CEO, Dr. Charles Bryan. So while you silence your cell phones and pagers and anything else you have that uh, beeps or buzzes, um, I'll let you know about some upcoming events, and there, there are quite a few. Uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, tomorrow uh, at noon, we'll be doing the, uh, the most recent installment of our Curators at Work series. Uh, our curator, Brittany Hutchinson, will be hosting a program called Talheimer's and the Richmond 34, where we'll be featuring a conversation between uh, Brittany and Elizabeth Johnson Rice, uh, and Elizabeth Talheimer Smart uh, to honor the Richmond 34. Uh, and they, of course, as you uh, hopefully know, were a group of Virginia Union University students who were arrested during a sit-in at uh, Talheimer's department store's uh, lunch counter in 1960. Um, Elizabeth Johnson Rice was one of those uh, who was arrested uh, at that event in 1960. And Elizabeth Talheimer Smart uh, is the granddaughter of uh, William Talheimer Jr., uh, one of the former CEOs of Talheimer's. And they uh, consequently uh, met while uh, Elizabeth Talheimer Smart was doing research on a book uh, about Talheimer's and uh, have formed a very fruitful and productive uh, friendship and relationship that they'll be talking about tomorrow. So that's a virtual program. I hope you'll join us for that. Uh, on September 13th at 7 p.m., our next movie myth-busting uh, program will feature a discussion of Lawless, a 2012 film chronicling the story of a 1930s bootlegging family in Franklin County, Virginia. On September 15th at 6 p.m., uh, we'll be featuring a discussion about uh, Devil's Half Acre. Uh, Kristen Green will join uh, Dr. Heron to discuss the subject of uh, Green's book and Heron's ancestry, uh, Mary Lumpkin, uh, an enslaved woman who liberated the infamous slave jail and transformed it into one of the nation's first black colleges. And then finally on September 17th at 6 p.m., uh, we will have our very first Virginia Distilled Festival. Uh, this is a ticketed event uh, for use who are 21 or older, uh, where you'll be able to sample spirits from distillers across the Commonwealth. There'll be live music, food trucks, and you also have after hours access to Cheers Virginia, uh, our new exhibition about 400 years of alcohol production. So hope you'll join us for that inaugural event. So today we're very pleased to have uh, Terry Alford with us, uh, who will be discussing his most recent book, in the Houses of Their Dead, the Lincolns, the Booths, and the Spirits. In the Houses explores two families, one at the nation's political summit and one at its theatrical, who are bound together by their fascination with spiritualism. Abraham and Mary Lincoln turned to the seance table with, when their son Willie died in 1862. Edwin Booth and his brother John Wilkes were also attracted to the other world by the death of Edwin, Edwin's wife, Mary, in 1863. Although there were many mediums in the country at that time, the number of prominent mediators to the other side uh, was limited. And the two families shared several of the most gifted ones, but no medium was more controversial than Charles Colchester, who amassed 
who amazed the Lincolns with his powers of being an intimate friend of John Wilkes Booth at the same time. So rather an interesting story right there uh, that they were both using the same person to uh, divine into the other world. Colchester repeatedly warned Lincoln to be careful. Would the president who received many such warnings over the years finally listen to the one that really mattered? Terry Alford is professor of history emeritus at Northern Virginia Community College. He's the author of several books, including Prince Among Slaves, the true story of an African prince sold into slavery in the American South, and Fortune's Fool, the life of John Wilkes Booth. Please welcome Terry Alford. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for, for the invitation for today. He's not here, he's overseas, but I'd like to thank uh, our mutual friend, Nelson Langford. Nelson actually read the manuscript of my new book and made many helpful suggestions. So if um, there are things you like in the talk of the book, you know, he deserves a nod of the head. And if, th if there are things you don't like, I think he deserves some of the blame <laughs> for that. Now, how much of the blame, I, I wouldn't presume to say. I mean, I, I wouldn't drive down here from Northern Virginia and tell you uh, how much to assess, but uh, I do appreciate in all uh, seriousness um, him and, and all he's done uh, here in this uh, wonderful institution and for me personally. You heard a reference to Fortune's Fool, uh, my previous book. It was The Life of John Wilkes Booth. And it was a standard biography. It uh, was divided into the usual four stages of a person's life. The, the four stages, all of our lives have four stages, right? The four stages. They're, they're briefly, uh, stage one, you believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> stage two, you no longer believe in Santa Claus. Stage three, you are Santa Claus. <laughs> stage four, you look like Santa Claus. <laughs> So those are the uh, the four stages of that book. And as I was going along and doing it, uh, I became aware that the Booths were really into spiritualism. Uh, it was known, I'd known for years, many people have heard that the Lincolns, especially Mrs. Lincoln, had gotten interested in seances and mediumship. And uh, I realized that they had an interest in common and indeed shared many mediums uh, at the seance table in common. And we'll We'll see about some of those today. So uh, thanks again for coming. And, and I hope this this is a talk, not a speech. I don't, speeches sound a little heavy. It rhymes with preach, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to give a speech. I just want to give a little talk on the subject. Um, modern American spiritualism, so-called modern, begins in this house in the 1840s. It's a humble place, as you can see, no longer standing, I believe, this is in Hydesville, New York, and it was the home for the Fox family. And there were uh, a, a number of teenage girls in the house. Uh, here we see two of them, perhaps the most famous, Margaret or Maggie on the left, and a sister who said that they were getting messages from a murdered man who was buried in the basement of their home. And they conveyed these messages to others through uh, rapping noises that they could make at a table. And the next thing you know, this phenomenon of receiving messages from the dead by, by 1850 was spreading all over the place. Now, this is a spiritualist image. I'm sorry, I, I should have blown up the kind of golden cloud area in the center, but, but what that is, is these are spirits coming down and entering the fox home uh, to deliver messages. This is rather a well-known uh, spiritualist image from that period of time. And the movement uh, of spiritualism through the Quakers and others began to spread very rapidly in the United States. It wasn't long before it made its way to Springfield, Illinois, and I would say probably by 1850, and attracted the attention of Abraham Lincoln. This is the earliest known likeness of him, taken in perhaps 1864 uh, 1846, rather, or 47, 
at about the time he was going to Congress for his one term there. He looks rather prosperous in this, I think, uh, like a city merchant and rather far removed from his uh, hard scrabble origins in, in Kentucky and Indiana. This image was probably taken at the same time. This, of course, is the uh, earliest known image of Mary Lincoln. And they were, um, I think, uh, attracted to spiritualism around 1850 when one of their um, sons died. This is Eddie Lincoln, died at the age of three in 1850, uh, most likely a pulmonary tuberculosis. The Lincoln family has some alleged interest in spiritualism even at this time, which you'll recognize as pre-Civil War, but uh, much more later on. The Lincolns were um, superstitious people. I remember Lincoln's law partner, William Herndon, who knew him pretty well, said that spiritualism was really so deeply ingrained in the future president that it was you know, like a big slab of marble, and then you'll see kind of a streak uh, of blue or, or gray or red running through it. And that was how he explained Lincoln's superstitious nature. And you, you do see it once you begin to investigate his life. For example, the number 13 bothered him. Uh, There's a story where he was going to sit down with some colleagues for dinner, and he realized he would be the 13th person at the table. And, and he wouldn't sit down. He said, well, I can't do it. I'll see you guys later. And one of them said, you know, I'd rather be dead than be that superstitious. You know, that's that that's just that's just crazy. Uh, Mary Lincoln was superstitious. She had a, um, a bringing uh, in a slave society, of course, had a quote unquote uh, nurse or mammy, quote unquote, mammy Sally, who filled her head with all sorts of stuff, particularly the story. And this is from Mary's childhood, Mary Lincoln's childhood, the story that um, every Friday, that the devil came and made an account of all the things you had done bad during the week. And his imps wrote these down in a book while the devil himself lashed, and, uh, sharpened his tail and, you know, glistened his horns. And, you know, Mary was so scared of this, she put her hands over her ears rather than listen to this stuff. Uh, Friday, as you can guess, uh, perhaps from the day of the crucifixion, was a, uh, considered the unlucky day of the week. You did not take a trip did not start a trip on Friday. You didn't plant crops on Friday. Abraham Lincoln was shot on Friday. Uh, little Eddie died on Friday. Lincoln's dad died on a Friday. Uh, it was just understood to be the one day of the week that you tried to stay away from. But that, that brings up um, an interesting question. And that was the relationship between spiritualism and superstition. In fact, I asked my one of my classes once, uh, what they thought about that. And I, I took a, here's a photo of them. It's a rather candid photo of my class when I asked them a question. Um, <laughs> have you ever noticed when you ask students a question, you have to ask it twice. The first time you ask it, they become aware that someone else is in the room with them. And then the second time you ask it for their benefit, right, you may or may not get the get, get an answer. Uh, I can say that spiritualists would absolutely say this, this no connection between being superstitious and being a spiritualist. Spiritualists of the 1850s and 60s felt they were very modern scientific people. They rejected ideas like hell and eternal damnation. They had no paid clergy. They promoted the equality of women. They were anti-slavery and in favor of every reform you could think of. So they always thought that, you know, they were quite uh, practical and modern and again, scientific. And, and how they could, they could honestly say, I guess, uh, anything that produces, say at a seance, that produces noises or music in the air or voices, you know, that, that's not your imagination. That's not a superstition. That's something you're actually hearing. I love this photo taken in the late 1840s. This is Junius Brutus Booth Sr. Um, on the left and his son Edwin Booth on the right. It's the only photo of the elder Booth with one of his siblings. So again, this is John Wilkes Booth's dad on his right, 
uh, and John Wilkes's older brother uh, on his left. Uh, they were quite into spiritualism. In fact, Old Man Booth, the elder Booth more properly, uh, was a believer in um, everything having uh, souls and afterlife, even animals. Uh, and he was very attracted to a poem by Byron. Uh, the poet Byron had a dog, uh, a Newfoundland named Botswain, who died of rabies. And it started this little debate about whether dogs uh, would be able to go to heaven. Uh, did they have souls? You know, when they obviously on earth, as the elder Booth said, you know, they showed affection, they showed loyalty, they showed love and courage for those they cared about. You know, they were better companions than many people in some cases. Why shouldn't they go to heaven? Of course they have a soul. As Byron put it in his poem, the poor dog in life, your firmest friend, the first to welcome, the foremost to defend, whose honest heart is still his master's own, who labors, fight, lives, breathes for him alone, unhonored falls, unnoticed all his worth, denied in heaven the soul he held on earth. Uh, Booth is very fond of that poem. He was reciting it one night. This is the elder Booth, of course. He was reciting it one night in Petersburg. Bitterly cold, too cold and bad roads to travel. So they were having uh, some refreshments at a tavern before uh, to, to let the light pass, the night pass away, and they could travel the next day. And uh, as Booth was reciting these lines to the uh, enjoyment of his friends, um, his foot kind of slipped down from the chair it was resting on and hit all of a sudden and inexplicably a dog. Booth said the dog had not been there a second before. It just appeared once the poem was being read. Nobody knew where the dog came from. Nobody knew who it belonged to. Nobody saw it come in. It was just there. And uh, this was a famous incident in the elder Booth's life. And he thought it was brought there by, uh, by what he called occult sympathy. Here's a picture of John Wilkes Booth's mother, Mary Ann Holmes. She was a, an interesting woman given to dreams and to visions. And if you look closely at this uh, image, if, if I could... Um, show you here, and you can see it in later photographs of her, she has extropia, where her left eye deviated outward. And it was thought that was thought to mean that she was more gifted than most people because she could see in two directions at one time. Now, I said she was gifted to visions. She had um, a well-known incident where when John Monks Booth was a baby, she was sitting at a fireplace and she was swept with this um, anxiety about what would happen to him, his future and, and his destiny. And she asked God to, to give her some foretaste of what that would be. And uh, she said, and this became a famous, uh, well-known anecdote in the Booth family, that the fireplace kind of flared up and the word country appeared in its flames. And that faded away to the word John the baby's name, John Wilkes, and then the fire died down. And from that point on, she had a, a feeling, a forecast, a portent, you know, that his destiny would somehow be entangled in, in his country and, and maybe not, maybe not to a happy end. This is John Wilkes, Bruce's older brother, the young boy shown in the joint photograph a minute ago, Edwin. One can always tell about how old Edwin is by looking at his hairstyles. And this is kind of early Civil War, early 63, 61, 2, 3. Interestingly enough, he was born on this night in 1833. This was the night of the greatest Leonid meteor shower ever recorded. I mean, it was an absolutely amazing thing to people. And it was understood that anyone born under a meteor shower was, as the servants at the Booth Farm said, gifted to see ghosts. And additionally, and oddly, he was born with a call on his face. So that was another sign of good luck, it was thought. Uh, and additionally, uh, any child born with a call, the, the legend went, was, uh, was not able to drown. Now, John Wilkes Booth got into uh, this a little bit, an early picture. I'm not so sure. I've often thought this was taken in Richmond, but there's no proof of it. Uh, but taken in Richmond right before the war years, that um, he had his fortune told 
in a very famous uh, incident by gypsies. In the early 1850s, gypsies were passing through the mid-Atlantic states. Uh, one of the ways that they would make a living was buying and selling horses. Um, they would also tell fortunes. People would go down to see them. Uh, the newspapers of the time said that they were atheists, although they did worship the stars. That was what the local newspaper said. John Wilkes Booth had his uh, fortune told by the requisite old crone, if I could put it that way. And she said, uh, I've never seen a worse hand. You know, that uh, I'm sorry I, I've seen it. You're going to die young. You're going to be loved by many people. You're going to be rich. You're going to be famous. And at the end of your life, you'll have a thundering herd of enemies and not one friend. She said, I wish I hadn't seen your hand. I, I hadn't seen a worse one. And um, he said, I'm supposed to pay you for that <laughs> for that fortune? <laughs> she said, yeah, yeah, I got to have the money, but I, I got to be honest with you too. And he was very troubled by that. He wrote out her fortune. He kept it on him uh, for the rest of his life. His sister said, nah, she, she doesn't know anything. That's just tattle. Don't pay any attention to that type of stuff. And he laughed. He said, yeah, you're right. But his sister, whose name was Asia, said yeah, over the years, you know, he would refer to it. it. It was clear that he had not forgotten it. This is one of the more famous comments of the 19th uh, century. It's actually a, a meteor procession, as you can see, where a meteor breaks up in the atmosphere. This is it being seen over New York City. Uh, and it was um, all well understood by a great number of people that a meteor like, a comet like this, uh, I mean, a meteor like this, I should say, foretold something and usually something bad. Uh, one appeared the night before Caesar was assassinated. I think that's pretty well documented from ancient sources. And later in this decade, Tolstoy in War and Peace uh, talked about how meteor events precede climatic events, usually the death of kings or national tragedies. And sure enough, about uh, nine months later, the Civil War took place. Uh, so many people thought, yep, I could have told you that, right? You remember, you remember the comment. You remember the comment. This is an interesting, uh, just I put that up just to bring on the subject of the war and the Lincoln's presidency. John Wilkes Booth, as you will know, was very pro-Confederate. And here in the collections or his, uh, is his Confederate flag. This doesn't seem very much. This is his own personal flag that he owned, uh, as you can see, and it's 11-star uh, Confederate silk flag uh, that he had in 1861 at the, at the beginning of the war. The Lincolns tragically lost another son once the war got underway in 1862. Willie Lincoln, 11 years old, died of typhoid fever uh, in the White House. Now, the death of any child is going to be tragic enough, but you'd have to say that this, this child, everyone says this was the best looking kid. This was the smartest kid. This was the most affectionate one. Mary Lincoln thought this is the one of all my four boys. This is the one that will take care of me when I'm old. This is the one that will care. And, you know, this is the one that will be there for me when, I, when I'm old and can do for myself. And, um, you know, they were just both mother and father were, were devastated by the death of this boy. And they brought in the requisite ministerial comforters. This is Reverend Francis Venton. He had lost children. Uh, so he had a special voice. He had lost four children but he had eight others at home. So life, even tragic life, had not rattled his self-confidence or I might say his self-regard. Many people said he was a tough case because he acted more like he was God's associate than his servant. <laughs> there is a big difference between those two, if you stop to think about it. Uh, he, by the way, was pastor at Trinity in New York City, you know, where Alexander Hamlin is buried, where George Washington went to church uh, when he was in New York. Mary is also comforted by this character, who's one of my favorite people in the new book. This is Reverend John Pierpoint. Um, this is J.P. Morgan, John Pierpoint Morgan's maternal grandfather. This is John Pierpoint. Uh, he had been a Unitarian minister, but had gotten into uh, spiritualism and had become a prominent spiritualist in Washington, D.C., where he was working during the war years as a clerk. Another prominent spiritualist in D.C. at the time was uh, 
Isaac Newton. Now, obviously, this is not Sir Isaac Newton, the genius. <laughs> In fact, this guy was far from a genius. He was only marginally educated, uneducated, according to many people. He was a simple farmer who, when the Lincolns came to the White House, he decided to send Mary Lincoln uh, uh, some spring peas. And he did as a gift. She wrote back thanking him. He was pleased to get her letter. He wrote back sending her some tomatoes. She wrote back. And at that point, you know, he opened the greenhouse on her. He deluged her with tomatoes, grapes, arm long strings of onions, you know, whatever he had, he just flooded her uh, with fruit and vegetables. And she was very taken away by his generosity, kindness. He was an amiable old fellow, I'll have to say that, although practically completely uneducated. And she began to demand that her husband give him a job. And Lincoln laughed, so I'll make him a brigadier general. Mary said, no, no, you listen to me. He gets a job. And really to please, and I might say to quieten her, uh, he made Newton the first U.S. Commissioner of Agriculture. Uh, so he put, he put uh, Newton in charge of that. Now, Newton was a well-meaning fellow, but he was just practically illiterate. Um, he was a very good boss. He was an able administrator and an excellent farmer. But he just really couldn't do things very well. He was always bumbling up his sentences and statements. One time he told Lincoln that birds didn't have plumage. They had foliage. <laughs> and, you know, Lincoln actually doubled over laughing when he said that. Uh, so Newton was kind of one of the inadvertently comic characters of Civil War Washington. But he was into spiritualism. So with Reverend Pierpoint, with Isaac Newton, who I might say, because he was so marginally educated, was teasingly called Sir Isaac by his critics in an unflattering comparison, uh, you know, to the great mathematician and physicist. They would go to seances with Mrs. Lincoln. Um, this is an interesting image from a book I'll tell you a little bit about in, in a second. But Lincoln would go to these seances with Mrs. Lincoln. I think A, curious, B, wanted to make sure that he knew what was going on there and she wasn't being taken advantage of and so forth. Uh, the lady at the piano is um, Bill Miller who lived in Georgetown. And in Miller's family was a story that Bell, during one of her uh, entrancements, you know, was actually elevating a piano, and Lincoln and the guys clambered on it to try to hold it down. Now, we have Bell's uh, word, whatever that's worth, we have Bell's word, no doubt wrapped in gold and notarized, that this event actually took place. Uh, I'm a little skeptical of Bell. I'm not skeptical of the sincerity of this tiny woman in her early 20s. Her name is Nettie Colburn. She's perhaps the best known spiritualist to deal with Abraham and Mary Lincoln. She published a memoir of her life in 1891, and she did had for it a number of images done, and these, the preceding one, as well as I think these two, and the next two come from that book of meetings that Lincoln had. She was a trance medium. In other words, she would sit still, the spirits would come and take her over, and then she would speak in a voice sometimes that of a, an Indian princess of long ago, sometimes a, a quaint New England doctor that she had known as a child. And um, she, she was absolutely, totally uh, sincere in what she was doing. Uh, you know, whether that was straight or not, you know, uh, that's a subject for later on. But she, uh, nobody ever accused her of being a fraud. She believed in what she was doing. You'll notice another thing about these seances at the White House. There are no darkened rooms. There's no table with people holding hands. There's no skulls. There's no candles. There's no creepy music coming from somewhere. A lot of these seances were held on brightly lit days or in rooms lit by gaslight and fireplaces. Um, there were social occasions. And I think that was attractive to Lincoln as well as to his wife. You know, people would gather, there'd be chit chat, someone would play the piano, there might be a recitation of a favorite poem or two, something like that. Uh, and then Nettie would lapse off into, um, you know, a, 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 a message session, which might last for 30, 45 minutes or an hour. Now, one of the things, it's kind of fortunate for Lincoln, I think, that 
public knowledge of this stuff was not very widespread. It seemed to have been known among his hardcore enemies, and they attempted to make some political use of it. But it was kind of indulged or discounted or dismissed by most people or just felt, well, you know, he's going because his quirky wife is, this is her latest quirk, so he's going to make sure her feet are on the ground, that type of thing. And there was a great deal of hostility to spiritualism, particularly in uh, the scientific and the religious community. I like this slide uh, of a seance in operation. Now, note most of the people on the right at the seance table are being uh, <laughs> pictured as dumb clucks uh, being hosted by a wolf. And that was a pretty fair reading of some people's take of, of what was going on uh, with the medium and his clients or victims. Uh, the other angle that spiritualism was attacked at was this. What is this? Is this Christian? Is this godly? You know, I mean, the dead, the dead go to God. You know, you don't hold them by the leg and try to keep them here. Believe me, they're in a lot better place with him than they are with you. So, you know, you must wait and you must be patient uh, if you want to see these people again. The problem, of course, with Mary Lincoln, of course, was she loved life so much. The idea of waiting till you see these people in heaven, she can't wait that long. Right? I mean, she wants to see them right now. And uh, I totally understand, you know, that impulse uh, that she felt. This is Molly Devlin, the very attractive uh, wife of Edwin Booth, John Wilkes' older brother. This uh, young woman died in pregnancy in uh, 1863 and plunged the Booths into the world of spiritualism. They went to see a number of spiritualists, including this cigar-chopping oracle. His name is Charles Foster. He also came to the White House and uh, dealt with Mary and, and uh, Abraham Lincoln, too. So you can see, as, a, as a, you heard in the introduction, the Lincolns and the Booths were seeing the same mediums. Sorry for the clip at the top. Grant recognizable on the on Grant's on, on the left here. This is Adam Badeau, one of Grant's military secretaries. He was the closest friend of Edwin Booth, uh, president with Grant through the war as a soldier, president of Appomattox, in charge of uh, relief for distressed civilians in Richmond at the end of the Civil War. So he plays quite a role in uh, the war around Grant and Grant Circle and staff, but also very close to the Booth family. He went to seances with the Booths. Uh, he was an atheist. He uh, didn't really believe that there was anything after you died, that that was the end of it, you know. But some of the things he saw at the seance table, and I describe an incident or two in the book, uh, did disturb him and confuse him profoundly. Badeau here on the left is gay also, which adds an interesting little sub-theme in the book, and I developed that as best as I can. John Wilkes favorite uh, mediums were not trans mediums, but physical mediums. These were people who could show you in this world, you know, not through a voice that who knows where that's coming from, but I mean from a noise, from something you could see. These were the Davenport brothers, uh, they were famous for being tied into a cabinet. I mean, tightly tied in a cabinet, door shut and locked. Next thing you know, you know, uh, Beethoven's Ode to Joy would be coming out of the cabinet. You pop it open. They're still tied right how you left them. Uh, they were absolutely amazing. And Harry Houdini said, late, he met one of them late in life. Houdini obviously is the next generation of people, but Houdini met one of the brothers late in life and and said that the, you know, they were the best, the absolute best, uh, most skilled uh, people uh, in doing what they did that he had ever seen. Toward the uh, end of the war, Edwin Booth, shown here in the center, more or less, was in Jersey City, New Jersey, when a, uh, another passenger waiting for a train fell between the train tracks and the platform. So Edwin, as we see here, reached out and grabbed and saved this person whose hat is flying off. And this is Robert Todd Lincoln, the oldest son of Abraham and Mary Lincoln. So bizarrely enough, John Wilkes Bruce's brother saved the life of Abraham Lincoln's oldest son. I had a lot of fun running down this young man. Charles Cochester, 
uh, English, the Lake Country. Um, uh, came to the United States when he was 60, well-educated, lived a bohemian life in New York City, and then uh, by 1861 had become a, a median and in fact, a very well-known one. This is clipped from one of the newspapers. And you can see he um, was not short in self-confidence, but he's, promote, he's promoting himself uh, very, very well. Now, he attracted the attention of Mrs. Lincoln, who was just amazed at Colchester's ability to produce noises from across the room. I mean, that was very weird. She brought him in to see the president. The president was mystified by what he was doing. So the president said, look, I'd like you to do something for me. Would you go over to the um, Smithsonian, he said to Colchester, and let Joseph Henry, the secretary, um, sit with you and, and study this phenomenon. And Charles said, sure, that's fine. So they went over. And as you might guess, and as I say in the book, the Smithsonian was a shark tank for the young mystic um, because Henry was not only a noted critic of spiritualism, but he was a, his scientific uh, focus was acoustics. So, you know, he was a master on sound and where it came from, and even what it was. And he put through Colchester through a number of tests. And um, at the end of the day, Henry couldn't figure out what Charles Chester was doing. He told Lincoln, you know, I'm, uh, I got to say right now, I don't know how, I think it's coming, a noise that he's making, but I have no idea how he's doing it. I don't, I don't know what this is. So, you know, Carol Chester was extremely skillful in whatever it was that he was doing. Indeed. Now, John Wilkes Booth uh, and Colchester were quite close at the same time which means in the weeks leading up to the murder of Lincoln and the tragedy at Ford's Theater, you know, the Lincoln's favorite medium was drinking and hanging out in Booth's hotel room. Um, little, this is a familiar image with Booth, very familiar, but little known and little notice was this. See that ring in the shape of a snake? Booth's snake ring? It's made from a stone he uh, obtained after a hike of a mountain in New Hampshire. And he said that this ring had almost uh, an occult influence over him. It was kind of a, a magic thing that he wore all, all the time. He began to get with the uh, Confederate collapse in 1865, drawn into his, to develop his plot against Lincoln, which as we know led to the disaster at Ford's Theater. This is an image not very commonly seen, so I wanted to share it with you. It comes from a Lincoln assassination memorial fan. There was produced in Cuba. So it has a number of scenes. This one depicting, not terribly accurately, but I guess good enough for the time, uh, what happened in the box at Ford's Theater. Now, what you might not know about this fan, this fan concealed a, a six inch knife. So it looks like just one of the fans that, you know, ladies used in that period of time, but there's a six inch knife in there. So you give it to your daughter when she goes out with that guy. And if, <laughs> if that guy is not the gentleman he appeared when he picked her up, you know, she just whips out the fan, right? And she, she's ready to deal with the problem. Not too many people get to hold the, the weapon. And I, you know, it's sort of one of my favorite pictures because they got my hands on it. I was pretty impressed with this, but yeah, you know, they have to watch this carefully. There were two police people standing about three feet from me when I was holding this thing, park police, armed park police. They don't want somebody grabbing it and running off. But there's the famous Derringer. Uh, as you can see, it's small enough to conceal in your hand. It is a single shot weapons. So, you know, once you fired one shot, that's it. You're not going to have time to reload. It's a one and done. And you, excuse me, then you drop it and then you take off as Booth did. Now, he, as we know, was tracked down uh, near Bowling Green, uh, Virginia, and killed 12 days after the murder. 
Um, Colchester had been run out of town by friends of Mrs. Lincoln, and they hoped he would disappear, but in fact, far from it. He became even more famous uh, than he had been before. In fact, he was arrested by the federal government, not for any spiritualist hijinks, uh, not for you know, not not for any association with Booth, I should say, but for something else. There was a revolute new law passed in 1864 to raise money for the war effort. And it said that anyone who practiced sleight of hand and practiced juggling needed to get a license. And he was very indignant about that. You know, he said, I, I don't practice sleight of hand. You know, I'm receiving messages in the same way that a minister, you know, or, or a believer hears messages from God. This, this is nothing phony about what I do. And so, you know, indignant that his profession uh, and himself were being attacked, um, he challenged the government to a trial. So there was a four-day trial that took place in Buffalo, New York, which attracted a great deal of attention late in 1865. You know, the question being, uh, is this on the level? Is spiritualism like a religion, therefore protected by the guarantees of the First Amendment? Or is this some hocus-pocus that shady individuals practice on easily deceived and grieving and uh, sorrowful people. And uh, it was an amazing trial, as you could guess. Every kook in the United States was in attendance at the thing. You know, um, they packed themselves in, people who were in favor of him, people who opposed him. Uh, the judge had trouble with the trial. Jurors forgot to show up. Dog fights broke out in the courtroom. You know, people would begin to sing spontaneously in the middle of testimony. I mean, it was, I'd have given anything to have been there. It sounds like, you know, uh, quite a hoot. But um, unfortunately, the government rounded up some people that were able to tell about Colchester. And one thing they said was the noise that he produced that mystified Lincoln and confused Secretary uh, at the Smithsonian, Joseph Henry, was he had a device on his biceps. And he could contract uh, his biceps and produce a clicking noise uh, that was imperceptible when he did it uh, to uh, other people in the room. Um, that he was capable of reading seal messages. Uh, I don't have time, I'm sorry, uh, to go into this too much, but you would present him, if you came to visit him, seal messages in little tablets and he would take one and hold it up and then he would answer your question. The way he did that, was he would take one and drop it in his lap. He could pick it up while storing the message. He would conceal it with his uh, thumb and little finger on his left hand, put it in his lap and read it while storing the messages and inviting you to put more in there. So we opened it up and would read one message. And then when he picked up the second one, he would answer the first one. So he was reading one message ahead <clears throat> in a pretty clever way. And some other things that he did that were very, very exceptional. <clears throat> Some people know, many don't, and I hope you find this interesting, that Edwin Booth died in 1893. On the day of his funeral, at the moment of his funeral, Ford's theater collapsed. It was a giant internal collapse of the theater. It had been renovated into office space uh, with books and files and desks and clerks in there. So when we go into Ford Theater today, everything you see is a reconstruction, every single thing you see. The only original things about Ford Theater are the exterior walls, okay? Inside was a, an office and some work in the basement and undermined the foundation of the building. So people on the fourth floor suddenly felt themselves dropping. There wasn't any forewarning, no noise, no shake, shake, let's get out of here. I mean, you're, you're sitting there at work on the fourth floor you drop on the third, the third and the fourth drop on the second, the second drops on the first, and you know these floors just cascade down into the basement of Ford's Theater, killing, I think, close to two dozen clerks. I mean, it is the ultimate, if you think about it, it's the ultimate bureaucratic nightmare. You're killed by your work, you're killed by your files, your desk, you know, everything you have at your job, it finally turns on you uh, and lets you have it. But the fact that this happened at the moment that Edwin Booth was having his funeral led to a lot of comment and thought about this whole Booth-Lincoln-Ford's theater thing 
And one New York Journal said, there is something gruesome and uncanny in the Ford's theater disaster, no matter how you look at it. We can safely say no other such tragic interest hangs over any building in this country through what mysterious combination of threads and events has brought about the melancholy association of the Lincolns and the Booths. Thank you very much. I'd be, I'd be glad to take a few questions if there are any. Um, What is that lady? You know, I wish I could remember off the top of my head. Um, Doesn't matter. <laughs> pretty striking, isn't it? Do I, you have uh, do you have any knowledge? Do you know if Lincoln ever met Booth? Um to to speak to each other, my answer is, and I was very interested in that question. Uh, to speak to each other, no. Lincoln saw Booth perform several times at Ford's Theater, strangely enough. And Lincoln had sat there and clapped. And Lincoln asked, Lincoln was very fond of actors and would often ask them to come between the acts. Oddly enough, there might be 15 minutes between acts, uh, unlike today, a very long period of time. So people could get a quick drink. I think you go outside, go to the little uh, the restroom while scenes were shifted. So actors would be invited to Lincoln's box and Booth was invited, but wouldn't go. They knew each other on site though. And I have one source that said when, uh, when Lincoln would pass Booth, uh, he would smile at him. And I thought that kind of a sobering thing to think about really. When you, but as far as changing words, no, I don't think so. Yeah, it's, Lincoln saw John Wilkes act, he saw Edwin Booth act, he saw Junius Booth Jr. act, their older brother, he saw John Clark, their brother-in-law act. So this was a little tighter world, right, than we think of. Because if you think about the assassins of the 20th century, their victims like President Kennedy and so forth, they never saw, thought, or heard of the people that shot them. You know, that, that, it's, it's very, very different than today. Anyone else have a question? Didn't Lincoln uh, eventually settle, in his own mind at least, the fact that spiritualism wasn't uh, wasn't a sound thing to believe in? Did, did, he, did he investigate uh, a spiritualist or uh, try to establish whether or not they were genuine? I, I think Lincoln was born short in the faith department. You know, he was a very practical person and he didn't really accept miracles. You know, he accepted, you know, the comforting and spiritual part of the Bible, but, you know, the whale swallowed me, but I'm okay. You know, those type of things, you know, he had a hard time with. And spiritualism, he, he never he never embraced it like his wife did. She, she was to a total believer, but he wasn't. Uh, and uh, he had faith, but it was of the coldest sort. Um, you know, as he put it, you know, what will be, will be, and no wish of ours can change the decree, was the way that he felt about that. Um, was there any relationship between um, Lincoln's guard? He was supposed to have a guard behind him and the booths in, in any way. I mean, I just heard about that. And I heard also heard recently that that guard went out to go take a drink while he was being shot. Yes, there was a policeman who was assigned to accompany Lincoln uh, and he got him safely to the theater, at which point the guard, Lincoln's carriage driver and another person went for a drink. The other two came back where the guard was, it was a very good, is a very good question. Um, there was someone sitting outside the box who more or less monitored who came in. It was Lincoln's valet. But again, he was a valet. <laughs> He was armed with good intentions, not pistols. Uh, one person came in, we know, to deliver a message. So it was not unusual for people to pop in, uh, unlike today. 
and and a lot of people. I think there was there were some people that started relaxing. I mean, the war is over, isn't it? I mean, if Lincoln can walk around Richmond and not get get shot, he could certainly walk around Washington. And there were probably a hundred soldiers and sailors in uniform in the audience. There was a general there. D.C. police chief was in the audience. Don't you think there were probably 200 people with weapons in the audience? I mean, it seemed very unlikely that at that point any, anything would happen to Lincoln. Now, the guard who accompanied them with the White House back and forth, um, he was charged with dereliction of duty, and then he was found not guilty. So the records in the D.C. police archives are missing. So we, we don't know why. We just said they looked into it and they decided, well, you know, either A, that wasn't your job, or B, you're not to blame. So it was just a bad confluence of, of events. But I noticed that Booth was like Lee Harvey Oswald. And I would say those are the two successful assassins. And the defining success is doing it and getting away. And you notice they both had one thing in common. They let the president come to them. You know, Oswald was in his place of work, that book depository, when he shot President Kennedy. And Booth was in his place of work, you know, a theater. So um, it was just a bad confluence of events, I think. Hi, thank you for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, during the time when John Wilkes Booth was on the run after shooting President Lincoln until he was killed, he kept a notebook and I believe, if I recall, that when that notebook was found, there were a lot of pages torn out. Do we know anything about those pages? Yes, there, there are a number of missing pages. He, uh, he never kept a diary per se, but on the escape, he did have a little kind of address memo book. He wrote in, in it in two spurts. So it's not, I went here, then I saw this guy, then I went there. It's more, you know, how he was feeling. Uh, there are missing pages, but some of the pages that are there, like have people's names and address, list of columns, you know, uh, with, with figures. Um, you're kind of like, be sure to tell mom so and so. Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of harmless. So the missing pages, there are pages missing, but um, I don't think most historians don't really apply, make anything of it really. It's not like, Here's a list of who's in it with me, you know, uh, and then rip, you know, there's nothing like that. It is curious they didn't produce the uh, diary at the trial of Booth's conspirators, fellow conspirators. They knew about it. In fact, it's even mentioned in the papers, but uh, the government just decided not to produce it. And the defense lawyers decided not to call for it. Because, you know, you don't want to ask questions you don't know the answer to already. <laughs> you know, maybe there's something in there that we don't want to hear in court. So they, everybody just kind of let the diary go at the time. Can I have one more question? I don't want to take up too much of your time. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when the theater collapsed on the day of the funeral, mm -hmm. was there ever any suggestion that it may have been an otherworldly <laughs> intervention? Yes. Uh, and there was um, maybe a comment overhead or something, but uh, there was there was a there was a very odd coincidence. The uh, person who built Ford's theater uh, was named James Gifford. Uh, he's the same person who built the Booth family home near Bellier, Maryland. So they dragged him out of the woodwork and he said, when I built that theater back during the war, it was fine. Don't blame me for this. Uh, what happened there was they were putting in a new heating or cooling system in the basement and they just weren't careful enough apparently to shore up the, the floors. And I don't know, maybe the floors weighed more Books weigh a lot, right? So maybe the floors weighed more than they thought they did. But um, a lot of people are exactly right. They thought this is, yeah, uh, this is just another story in, in the book, you know. Well, thank you so much for your attention.